Uh, welcome to Adventure. Joining us today is Debbie Slaver. Debbie is Director of Sales and Marketing at SPC Tech, a marketplace consulting agency that offers a full spectrum of data-driven marketplace management and marketing services. With a career spanning more than two decades, Debbie has worn multiple hats in the field of marketing and sales. And she's gonna chat with us today about how to handle Amazon seller support, as well as getting expedient results and the best way to get relisted if your account has been suspended. So thank you for joining us, Debbie. Uh, it's great having you here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, can you walk me through a scenario where an Amazon seller's account might be suspended? And then um, how would you advise them to handle that situation effectively? Well, typically, I mean, there are different reasons. The one that we see the most is that people aren't adhering to Amazon policies. You know, uh, a section three where Amazon has you know, all of these policies that they want everyone to pay attention to. And sometimes you don't even know. It can be something as simple as just you put on a listing that, like a health or wellness listing that it could cure instead of saying it assists. You can't put like, you know, authoritative type information without FDA approval and all of that type of stuff. So, so there are several reasons why you could get deactivated if you violate any of Amazon seller performance policies. Now that could be your shipping rate. It could have to do with your order defect rate or even customer service reviews, maybe intellectual property infringement where you're advertising a brand new that you don't have authorization to do, and then incorrect or product listings, like you're making claims that it cures instead of assists with, or, um, and then of course there's re, uh, restricted product that you can't sell at all on Amazon. Uh, so that's interesting. So would you say that obviously it sounds to me like the best course of action is to really be um, knowledgeable about Amazon's policies when your account is suspended I'm guessing they give you the reason why. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. They do give you a reason why, and they want you to submit a plan of action, but they want you to, in the plan of action, tell them what the root cause is. And the root cause doesn't always match what the email said for the reason why you got deactivated. At SPC Tech, what we typically do is a complete account assessment before a plan of action because we found a lot of times their emails don't match up with what they consider to be the root cause you're saying amazon identifies yeah. the root cause uh well amazon in their plan of action their first paragraph they want really to be the root cause they want you to identify it so one of the things amazon definitely wants is every plan of action needs to be very personalized they don't want a template out there that everybody can use to get reinstated. So one of the ways they do that is that by asking that your first paragraph in a plan of action identify the root cause. Interesting. Uh, well, that's good to know, especially um, if you're trying to expedite getting that product listing back up and running. You know, every hour is lost sales, right? Yes, exactly. And so what we would typically tell you if you were going to call customer support or get some quick results, the first thing you have to do is always pay attention to every notification that Amazon sends you. I am often amazed when a client comes to us and they've had four notifications and they did, what'd you do with this? Nothing. I just read it. You know, if Amazon is sending you some kind of a notice, they want some kind of a reply to it and stuff. So if they say we need to see invoices, send them your invoices, you know? Um, so, when you're getting ready to contact customer support, there are two things that you should do first. Make sure that you've read through all the emails and notifications that you have gotten from Amazon so that you have a really good idea because Amazon seller support, that's all they know. What they're looking at is Amazon's notifications. So that's what they know. And so if you will familiarize yourself with that. And then the second thing is have your documentation for the phone call. If they want you, if they ask you to download, you know, ID or bank statement or something of that type, and it's related to what they've already told you in your notifications, you can do it right there when you're on the seller support. And there are two ways to get to seller support. One is a phone call and because of volume, you'll have to sit on it and wait for a while. That's the quickest way. 
but the other one is through email and email takes longer for somebody to get back to you. So it depends on what your, you know, your objective is at that point. Hey, I just need to get this taken care of, or I don't care how long I wait on the phone. I'm just going to sit here and wait for somebody to come to me. When you are, let's, let's say that I'm a seller, right? And I, I've had to deal with the, the seller support before. Uh, a common complaint is that it takes so long and you almost feel um, like you're not as valued by the customer support with how long it takes, you know, mm -hmm. how yeah. can, as a seller, how can I expedite the process of getting reinstated? Are there any like tips, tricks, or what do you do? So I wish there was. <laughs> However, <laughs> when we when we work in Amazon's world, we play by Amazon's rules. And it's probably the hardest thing for us to explain to clients is that we're on their timetable. We've had people who are reinstated within a couple hours, a couple days, and a couple weeks, a couple months. So sometimes it is absolutely at their discretion. And and customer support, I'm sure you've probably noticed this, Joseph, but when you get them, sometimes you get someone who can be really helpful and is extremely knowledgeable. The next time you may get somebody who you're not sure if it's their first day at work or not. You know, they're not really clear. You don't know what if they're understanding you well. I always tell someone, even though you've waited on the phone, if they can get you to somebody else, do it if they say i'm the only person available call back and get someone else if you're not comfortable with the customer support that you're receiving call back and get someone else because it just doesn't make sense to take your time i mean yes you've waited but now i'm going to explain all of this and i don't even know if they're getting it so you can personally kind of escalate that situation if you feel it's necessary yeah if you feel yeah, if you feel like they're not they're not understanding what I'm saying. And the one thing to remember when you're talking to anybody from customer service or customer support is no emotions. Don't get emotional about this. It doesn't benefit you in any way. And I know that's really easy to say if you just had your account deactivated and that's your only source of income. Right. You know, uh, you're you're anxious, you're maybe mad. You know, you're frustrated. And so all I would say to you is the less emotion that you can use during all of the transactions, whether it's through email or conversation without emotion, the better you are. Just lay out the facts and provide the documentation. So yeah. let me let me ask you, um, because, you know, it seems like Amazon changes things almost on a daily basis. Yeah. How do you stay on top of all of the policies to ensure that, you know, you're advising your clients with the most up-to-date information? Well, I mean, obviously the best place for information is Seller Central. You know, they'll, they'll outline the policies. Anytime they do change a policy, you will get an email notifying you that. And again, don't ignore your emails that you get from Amazon look at it. If you don't understand it, that's the time to go to a seller forum. See if someone else can explain it to you in, you know, it's like if you're in a doctor's office and he's talking in medical terms, I don't know medical terms. I need to ask him to, or the nurse, somebody, please explain this to me in plain English, right? That, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's great advice. So in your experience, what are some of the most common mistakes or misunderstandings, I guess, that lead to account suspensions? I know you said a lot about product listings. So we're talking about potentially people that are just listing a product, maybe are new to Amazon, but there, I know that there's many um, Amazon sellers out there that are you know, veterans that still um, are getting uh, tons of suspensions and some of them um, are valid and some of them don't seem to be so valid, so. Yeah, exactly. One of the things that we're really seeing currently that is probably a high reason for deactivation is what they're calling inauthentic product. You know, in uh, June of 2023, they passed the Inform Consumer Act. Mm 
which basically says a consumer has a right to know whether or not their product is legitimate. Amazon jumped on that right away with brands and stuff like that. And so Amazon has always had the little AI bots that are in the background looking for inconsistencies or things like that, but they ramped them up. I mean, they really just like turned them on and said, we need to know if they're selling Nike that they have permission to sell Nike, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so they started requiring a lot of invoices and your invoices have to be from what they would consider approved distribution sources. So like there's a lot of um, fulfillment, warehouse fulfillment companies that are out there that don't have proper authorization to sell the stuff that they're selling to you. And so I would say always make sure your source of product can get you any documentation you might need. That's a great tip. Uh, we were going to ask you about what are some uh, proactive things that sellers can do, um, at least number one, to avoid account suspension. So being super organized, having that paper trail, uh, leading back to your original source, because what I'm hearing is that Amazon will just suspend the account and then ask for it later instead of asking for it first and then that's a great observation that like any business, you need to be organized. Where do your invoices, where are you storing them at and stuff? We have people who are like, I know I, I can show you on my bank where I paid for it, but I don't have an invoice and I can't get in touch with the distributor now. You know, they've stopped answering my calls. So you need to make sure that it, even if you've asked the right questions from the beginning, that when you get the documentation that you are keeping it all in a really good, well-organized manner. Right. Because I could buy knockoff sneakers from Bobby on the street corner and still show an invoice from my bank statement saying that I paid for it. Doesn't necessarily prove the origin of that product. Um, and that's really what Amazon is looking for, the origin of the product mm -hmm. so that they can ensure it's valid yes. um, and the manufacturing of it. Um, a lot of products out there have, you know, safety issues, that kind of thing. So um, that is good. It's a consumer protection, uh, I think. Um, yeah. But for a lot of sellers could mean massive headaches. So. And so, you know, I think it's important that you do understand that, you know, Amazon isn't really doing this to make it difficult for everyone. They're trying to make it safe for everyone to shop on there. And can you imagine having the masses of individual sellers or stores per se? Let's say it was a mall and you had that many stores. You know, how could you ensure that everyone was doing good business practices? So while it is unfortunate, it's also the reason why people trust Amazon when they shop there. Right. That that's really important. You know, I think um, it used to be back in the day what caveat emptor, right? Buyer beware. Um, but I think it's gotten so sophisticated now that that's almost impossible. Um, yeah. You'll have a product that looks legitimate. The listing looks legitimate. So definitely good to keep in mind that Amazon's really kind of forefront of thought is right. um, people have to have trust in the products that we list um, yes. on our marketplace. So. Uh, and if I wanted the cheap knockoff products, I'd just shop on Timu, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even going to edit that out. <laughs> so, well, let me ask you this, Debbie. Um, are there times where a seller's account will get suspended? Um, they will provide all of the information and it'll remain suspended. Um, how does one then go through an appeal process and how big of a headache is that? For sellers. So it's actually really common that you might provide them with an invoice and then they might tell you it's an unverifiable supplier. In other words, their invoice may not have contact information on it. Invoices should always have an email and a phone number on there. Uh, and, you know, some of these places that are providing you with invoices don't have contact information. So that's a very common one on invoices that Amazon will say this is unverifiable. I mean, you could have made it on your own computer, right? Uh, because it doesn't have an address. We can't, you know, verify them at all. So when you do an appeal, even if they don't accept or it's unverifiable, your source is unverifiable. If you can still show Amazon, look, I'm a legitimate 
you know, concerned business. I have good business practices and stuff like that. Um, I made a mistake. I bought something from an unverifiable supplier. Sometimes we will rec we will ask people that we're getting reinstatements for to go to their bank and we'll give them a form of an affidavit that you can actually say, I swear with perjury, you know, under the risk of perjury and stuff that I did not do this on purpose. I will not do this in the future. I have put together new criteria for how I find my suppliers. So even if you do have an invoice that is unverifiable, you just move to the next option, which is saying, look, I made a mistake. But don't make a habit of that, right? No, because that <laughs> you can be a repeat offender mm -hmm. and then Amazon isn't going to believe that you're actually going to change your business mode. So yeah. I don't think there's a rehab program out there for no. uh, Amazon sellers that continuously get unverifiable uh, no. invoices. Yeah. I think the big thing after people get reinstated that you should probably remember is that it's affected your uh, BSR or your best seller rate. Yeah, Joe mm -hmm. had a question about that. Yes. Uh, um, Joe, if you want to hop in, this is perfect time. Perfect time. Yeah. So what do you suggest to your customers? I think you were just about to roll right into it. What do you suggest to your customers that they do on their advertising strategy to recover that BSR? Not only advertising strategy, but promotions, deals, yes. email right. strategy. You know, the first place that you're going to want to go is to look at your account health and make sure that your account health is healthy enough for you to get into some of the advertising things that you want to do. All right. And the reason I say that is because when you get into deals and promotions, if you don't have good account health, it probably won't help you at all. So we usually say, you know, look for strategic discounts maybe where you can run some targeted promotions to attract customers and boost some of their sales where there's no additional fee um, consider creating a lower selling price for a temporary period to attract traffic and stuff because now you're trying to get back up in the rank lightning deals is an exceptional way to really bring up your best seller rank um, utilize their limited time deals that generate interest in sales. A lightning deal uh, is typically a period of four to 12 hours. It costs $150 per deal, except during prime events. It can cost much more during that, 300 to 500 probably per deal. And that's it does that's Yeah. It does reduce your profit margins, but understand this, it increases sales, visibility, it gives you a competitive advantage, and it will give you a review boost, which of course, all of those are coming together working on your BSR or your bestseller rank. And so, you know, you can also use lightning deals if you're trying to just liquidate through some of your inventory because it's been sitting on the shelf too long at Amazon and they're telling you, you know, you have to get rid of it and stuff like that. But there's no guarantee that any of these deals, I mean, Amazon doesn't guarantee anybody anything, right? So there's yeah. no guarantee that they will do them. So do your research. When's the right time to do them and stuff like that? Then you can do coupons. Put a coupon on there, uh, offer incentives, and just improve your conversion rates by having coupons. Uh, a coupon will probably cost you approximately 60 cents per purchase. This is not a per click thing. This is actually if you make a sale. So, you know, you know and one of the hacks we've shared earlier was that um, just running coupons is a good strategy overall because not everybody, there's many people that will buy the product and forget to click on the coupon or. Um, oh, that's a big thing that even though you're running the coupon, it doesn't mean that everybody who's there, because you know, the way that Amazon does, it's on the buy box and it just has a little tiny thing that says, <laughs> On, you know, two dollars off. If you don't click on it, you don't get it. But you are, as a seller, are still getting credit for the fact that you had the coupon there, right. right? So I think there's a lot of things that you can do. You probably do want to look at PPC, and at least for the first two weeks after you get reinstated, you're going to want to bump 
what you're doing on PPC. If you've never done PPC, I would say after a reactivation, I mean, look at what your BSR was prior and what it is now. And if there's a big difference, consider at least for a couple of weeks, putting some money into PPC. And I would say, I'd, I mean, I myself, if I were the business owner, would probably consider it for over a month, putting it on there just to get me back up in the ranks and stuff like that. Yeah, it seems like a small investment compared to, um, you know, the loss that you would take not improving your BSR. Yeah, because, you know, here's the, here's the real thing is that you finally get your account back. You were anxious, you were frustrated, you were mad about the fact that they shut down your account. But now it's like you're starting all over again and you got to build that back up. And everyone knows, although you see all of the ads that tell you you can make $10,000 a month on Amazon, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. You have to really work to get within that. I think being in the industry, that's probably one of my pet peeves is that every time I go to the computer, I'm seeing these people advertising how easy Hmm. It is to sell on Amazon and it's not easy. Well, it's not 2015 anymore. No, no, exactly. And you really have to have people who help can help you understand it, whether that is your seller forums or you contact, you know, uh, an Amazon representative and stuff. You know, the first day that you go on, you're probably not going to get a, a sale. You're probably not going to get a sale. There are people who may be selling very similar product who've been on there for a long period of time. They have built their standing with Amazon. They have reviews. So if you're thinking about getting in an Amazon business, you better understand that you've got to be patient. Absolutely. Uh, and know that you're probably going to have to spend money. You know, yes. it's not just about purchasing the product and, and leaving it there. Um, yeah, a lot of people come to us and they, I, I always tell people, I equate it to, if you were a business owner opening up a restaurant, you're going to sign a lease for the property. If nobody comes to eat at that restaurant, you still got to pay that rent. Right. right? I mean, until you can build up. Here, right. I mean, yeah. how are people going to buy from you if they don't know you exist? So exactly. marketing income, that's just, you know, common business and it would be no different if you had a brick and mortar storefront. Yeah, and that's the thing I think people don't understand because it's been made to look so easy mm -hmm. to just jump in and make big bucks. But it can be yeah. lucrative and it can be done. Uh, you know, the yes. one trend that we are hearing over and over is 90% of your investment is going to be spent, you know, prior to product launch. So do your research, find mm -hmm. out what Amazon's policies are, make sure that you're listing your product correctly, Make sure that you have all of your documentation in order. So we are a little bit up against the clock right now. So I have a few more questions for you. Sure. Give us, um, let's say, your top tip for being proactive prior to having your account suspended. Your top tip for once your account does get suspended um, and dealing with that. And then what would be your top tip for appealing a suspension if you've already provided the, doc the documentation? The first one was my top tip for... Prior to do prior to. Okay. Pay attention to your notifications. You need to be very aware of what is going on with your account. You cannot just set up the store and walk away, even though you might be shipping FBA and they're sending all your product out. This is your business. So pay attention to their emails. That's the number one thing I would tell people is no, uh, if Amazon is sending you an email telling you that you're violating a policy, they're not going to go away. It just gets worse. It's like, like you know, IRS. you don't have to open up your delinquent mail when it's say. in the mail, but it's not going away. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and then you said the top tip for what to do when you get suspended. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend being sure that you understand the reason for your suspension. As I mentioned, Anytime that you do a plan of action with Amazon, they want it to be very specific and concise. They want it to be personalized. They don't want you to be talking in general generalities. They want you to just say, this is the problem and I'm going to correct it. Mm -hmm. If you have to appeal again, I would say, look at all the correspondence that you have gotten from Amazon. Understand what happened. Some of Amazon's emails are not real clear. Like you can get 
uh, deactivated for inauthentic product. And you're like, well, it's real. I mean, and I've been selling it for years. <laughs> exactly. You know, so I don't, I don't get it. They probably didn't use the best terminology. What they're saying is that they don't think you have a legitimate source. Interesting. Okay? They're not saying it's inauthentic. They're not saying it's counterfeit, even though sometimes some of the emails you get will use those words. Make sure that you understand what Amazon is really wanting from you and be organized. Yeah, I think was, that's great advice. I think uh, a lot of times there's a verification meeting after a deactivation. That is your best opportunity right there to show that you are a good business person. You have good paperwork, you, you know, all of that type of stuff. I would use that verification meeting as your jumping stone into anything else. That's um, yeah, great advice. So it sounds like, you know, like you said, this is a business. So be professional. Don't don't let your anger and frustration out on the customer uh, or seller support representative. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, treat again, treat it like a business, make sure that you get those verifiable um, invoices that you have trusted sources right from the beginning. So hopefully this won't be an issue for you and, you know, just be organized. So um, all great tips and very easy to do and within everyone's control. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Debbie, we have one more question for you before we let you go. You know, we do call this podcast adventure because we talk about ventures and e-commerce, but we always ask everyone, what's the biggest adventure adventure that you've ever been on in your life? Wow. I went to Zanzibar. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I've actually been to Africa six times. I love it. But I went to Zanzibar, which is a small island just off of the coast of Tanzania. And it was just a magnificent trip. Um, Zanzibar was actually a slavery uh island so when they found people that they were going to put into slavery they would take them to an island and keep them there until the boats came and got them right oh so it was just really rich in history and it really helped you to understand all of the things that you don't see every day and stuff like that but i think yeah any of my kilimanjaro i mean any of my trips to africa would be high on my list i love the continent. Yeah, it's on my bucket list. And, you know, everybody that, that has been there and talks about it, it just sounds so magical and wonderful. Yeah, so. a safari or something like that, you absolutely have to do it. Well, it was an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. We learned a ton. Hopefully, everyone listening learned a lot about account suspension. Um, we'll put your information in our show notes. So uh, pay attention to that if you want more info on SPC Tech. Be sure you subscribe to the Adventure uh, newsletter and podcast, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you so All right. much. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.